turn that down. Yeah. Refresh that one. See if we're see if we're live. Okay, hi. Um, so welcome to the platypus teaching on empire and social democracy. Um, and just to give some background on why we're doing this teaching and what we hope to accomplish with it. Uh, so a lot of discussion after the 2007-2008 economic crisis, which also happened to coincide with the 75th anniversary of the New Deal, um, raised the question of a possible neo-Keynesianism, a Keynesian response to the economic crisis, as opposed to the prevailing neoliberal um, policies pursued by the United States, but also by other um, governments. So uh, in thinking about the question of Keynesianism and neo-Keynesianism and neoliberalism, uh, I thought that it would be helpful to go back to the beginning of the story namely the 1970s downturn and uh, the, the neoliberal revolution that was already underway by the end of the 1970s. Um, and so as such, I thought that a good text for us to discuss would be um, this Capitalism for Beginners, uh, part of the For Beginners um, series, you know, Marx for Beginners, Freud, Freud for Beginners, and we read the Lenin and Trotsky for Beginners, um, because it's written by uh, Robert Lekachman, who uh, was a, of an older generation prior to the New Left, he's a full generation older than the 1960s New Left, and uh, was a Keynesian econo economist who um, uh, had a crisis of faith in Keynesianism in the 1970s and uh, converted to Marxism and wrote this book in response to the advent of neoliberalism. And so what we'll find, uh, you know, in the comic book is, of course, this drastic uh, demonization of not only Milton Friedman, but also Friedrich Hayek and, and others. Uh, and he also, unfortunately, the Kochman, throws Adam Smith under the bus, um, because Adam Smith is, of course, uh, seen as the inspiration for neoliberalism um, of Milton Friedman in particular. Um, so I don't know if you guys got a chance to see, <clears throat> via the Facebook invitation, I linked a couple of short clips on YouTube um, from Milton Friedman's um, TV show that, that he had in the 1970s called Free to Choose, right? Um, but anyway, it's a, it's a good little, there are a couple of little clips um, that uh, pit Milton Friedman against Francis Fox Piven and also Thomas Sowell. Um, anyway, so you have Thomas Sowell and Milton Friedman against Francis Fox Piven, essentially um, a neoliberal attack on the new left. Uh, and uh, you know, I think that it's, it's good because, of course, they get down to um, the question of freedom and what's meant by freedom and the discontent with the welfare state and also the, uh, the controversy around Milton Friedman's ideas being taken up by the Pinochet regime. Uh, after the coup in Chile in 1973. So, and that also features in this book. Um, it's also, if you recall, and we're already getting several years uh, out from this phenomenon, but one of the people on the left who had a lot of currency around the time of the economic crisis was Naomi Klein. And her book, The Shock Doctrine, is an indictment of uh, neoliberalism and the collusion of neoliberal free market ideology with state power and of course traces the story back to the, the Pinochet regime in Chile um, but also through the Thatcher and Reagan revolution and all the way up to the present. 
um, and which is something that Lakachman also addresses, in other words. Um, to use an expression of David Harvey's, uh, beginning in the 1970s, we don't so much have an anti-Fordist or anti-Keynesian um, form of capitalism, but rather we have a post-Fordist and post-Keynesian form of capitalism. In other words, that what's happened is that uh, certain aspects of the post-World War II form of capitalism have remained in place while others have been changed, or really an emphasis has been shifted. Uh, also in the book you might notice um, Lakachman talks about the roots of monetarist economic policy, uh, which is associated with neoliberalism, in Keynesianism itself. In other words, that monetarist turn in terms of economic policy, the idea of um, calibrating the economy by adjusting interest rates, this kind of thing. And there are, there are other um, factors assumed and involved in that, but that that's actually not something new, but rather a carryover from Keynesianism. And so what we have, uh, starting in the 1970s, is not so much anti-Keynesianism or anti-Fordism, um, but or it really we can't take for granted its anti-state ideology, but rather what we have is a modification of uh, the state-centric form of capitalism that emerged in the 20th century. And that really um, you know, took on uh, a seemingly viable life after World War II in the golden age of the 1950s and 1960s. Okay, so um, where to begin with this? Well, one of the things that I like also about the argument that Lukachman makes in his book is that he begins and ends with a historical prognosis on capitalism. In other words, he begins by saying no serious commentators on capitalism, whether ostensibly for or against capitalism, have seen it as a permanent system, but rather as a transitory uh, form, and that some have rejoiced in this uh, transitory quality of capitalism and others have regretted it. Right? And, but nonetheless, it's always been seen as something that uh, is not meant to be a permanent state of affairs. Right. Of course, that's where he ends the book. You know, what's the future of capitalism? Is there a future for capitalism? And, and you know, what do we mean by capitalism when thinking about it as a historical phenomenon? Um, and I think that that's something for us to, to bear in mind with respect to platypus, because one of the questions that we would raise is, um, well, do we live in capitalism anymore? Meaning we might live in a society that calls itself capitalist and it's back with the neoliberal revolution, uh, especially in the 1980s. So Forbes magazine um, kind of promoted itself as a capitalist tool. That's what it described itself as. It kind of reappropriated the language of the left. Um, and uh, there's also a great scene in um, the Oliver Stone film on Nixon, which also uh, tries to capture this moment of the early 70s, the economic crisis and Nixon's role in the economic crisis, where the new left, uh, it, Oliver Stone has the new left raising the banner, um, Nixon tool billionaires rule, right? Like meaning that, um, in fact, we can't, blame Nixon for this, and I think that Oliver Stone has a, has a scene in which um, Nixon goes late at night to the, uh, to the Lincoln Memorial and has a kind of crisis of conscience, thinking about his, his own presidential leadership, like what does it mean, and uh, you know, is he really leading or is he kind of serving another purpose, and he gets confronted by some protesters, you know, it's totally staged. And uh, you know, basically they come to an impasse because the protesters themselves realize that they can't blame Nixon for what's going on. Um, anyway, so this is you know, the deep background for thinking about the question of capitalism now would be the question of how capitalism was seen in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, now, when we in Platypus tried to address the economic crisis through a series of fora, radical interpretations of the present crisis, one of the readings that the committee that organized that series did was Moish Pastone's uh, article, kind of extensive essay, on uh, Daniel Bell and Ernest Mandel, which parallels um, the formulation in the title of one of the last readings we did in the reading group um, that we do in the reading group from Adorno, Late Capitalism or Industrial Society. In other words, and Adorno wrote that in 1968, 
Uh, Postone, of course, is writing in the, in the 2000 zeros, but looking back on the 60s and 70s, the question was, okay, what is this form of society? So Danielle Bell had this idea of industrial society, and Ernest Mandel had the idea of late capitalism, right, kind of orthodox Marxist late capitalism, and uh, Adorno formulates it as, um, in the forces of production, we are an industrial society, but in the relations of production, we're a late capitalist society. And what's meant by late capitalist is, of course, a kind of decadent, deteriorated form of capitalist social relations. That's also what Lukachman is trying to grasp um, in his approach. In other words, he's saying, well, in what way can this be considered capitalism? So he starts the book and ends the book with kind of bullet point uh, definition of capitalism according to various factors. Um, and they're significantly different, actually. I think that the one that he starts with is, is in some ways more substantial than the one that he ends with. Um, on the very first page, what is capitalism? Uh, <clears throat> the bare basic essentials of capitalism are these. One, capital is the portion of a nation's wealth that is man-made and therefore reproducible which I'll get back to that in a second. Two, under capitalism, a society's capital equipment, its means of production, is owned by a minority of individuals who have the legal right to use this property for private gain. And three, capitalism relies on the market system, which determines distribution, allocates resources, and establishes the income levels, wages, rents, and profits of the different social classes. Um, just to turn to the, to the end of the book, um, uh, on 169, he, he lays this out again, but with some modification. Um, capitalist economy, whether Keynesian, monetarist, or otherwise, is based on certain assumptions. One, individual calculation and in the pursuit of self-interest. Two, the accommodation and adjustment of private interests through competition. And three, the market force, forms of exchange based on commodities, money, and the law. There was a lot packed into this, um, into these formulations, and so I want to kind of go through them and then get at um, what I think is interesting about Lukachman's argument, but also what um, is problematic, uh, at least from a Marxist perspective. Um, so one thing straight away from the first page definition of capitalism is that, of course, uh, items one and two, capital is the proportion of a nation's wealth that is man-made and therefore reproducible, and under capitalism, a society's capital equipment, its means of production, is owned by a minority of individuals who have the legal right to use this property for private gain. The thing that immediately comes to mind for me is Nikolai Bukharin's, um, I think it's the ABCs of, cap of, of communism, I'm not sure though, it might be another text, in which he starts out by saying a common mistake is to treat capital as a thing. Right? What capital is, is a social relation. Um, and what he meant by that was that capital is a phenomenon of the social relation of wage labor to um, the means of production. In other words, the capital is not the means of production, even though that's the colloquial expression, that from a Marxist standpoint, what capital is, is the relationship of the workers to the means of production. It's not the means of production itself. It's not a thing, but it's a social relation. And that therefore that changes the character of what one means by property, by private property. In other words, to say that capitalism is characterized by private property in the means of production does not mean that capitalism is the rule of private property in the means of production. It's rather that private property in the means of production is a phenomenon of the relationship of the workers to the means of production. It's not itself like the thing. And, you know, just to use a term that we're familiar with from Lukács, what Bukharin was saying was to treat capital as a thing is to reify it, whereas, in fact, the point is to grasp it as a phenomenon. Um, so it's one of the things that, that um, Lukáčman does. It doesn't, doesn't, you know, it's not a fatal flaw of his argument, but it's a particular kind of way of approaching um, the argument. Um, then there's the question of the market. Um, and that's the concern of the third item on, on the first page. Capitalism relies on the market system which determines distribution, allocates resources, and establishes the income levels, wages, rents, and profits of the different social classes. And then, of course, the, the three bullet points that he gives towards the end of the book on 169. Um, 
this is also very much concerned with the market, individual calculation and the pursuit of self-interest, the accommodation and adjustment of private interests through competition, and the market forms of exchange based on commodities, money, and the law. Um, so what I want to do is kind of work backwards from the market forms of exchange based on commodities, money, and the law. Um, the law, like that, you know, says a lot straight away. In other words, um, capitalism is based on bourgeois society, and bourgeois society is the rule of law. Right? It's not simply the rule of private interest, it's the rule of the law. Um, so there's a lot sort of built into that. And so what occurs to me there is what we've discussed from Dick Howard's The Spectre of Democracy. In other words, that political forms and democracy need to be understood as constitutive of the commodity form in bourgeois society, not epiphenomenal. Um, and I think that Lukachman also has this idea, and certainly when we get to it later, Michael Harrington also has this emphasis on the question of the constitutive character of democracy and posing the contradiction of capitalism at the level of democracy. The Kochman's also doing that, which, which we'll see in a moment. Um, finally, to help set things up, um, I wanted to make mention of Adolf Reed's recent formulation uh, when he talks about the ideology of the present and how policy presents itself ideologically uh, in a kind of neoliberal and post-neoliberal environment. Uh, he says, well, look, there are two essential aspects to neoliberalism as a phenomenon, uh, whether claimed or otherwise, in other words, in reality. One is uh, reliance on markets, and the other is a redistribution of income upwards from the bottom to the top. And he said, in a pinch, which one do you think gets jettisoned? Which one gets thrown out the window? The free market. Right. In other words, what remains is the um, upward distribution of income. It's what Lukachman lays out in terms of a possible solution to the crisis of the 70s. In other words, he says, look, there are various ways out. And his preferred one, which he thinks is desirable and possible, is democratic socialism, and we'll come, come around to what that means. It's a rather tepid kind of, uh, you know, it doesn't end with a bang, but rather with a whimper, this book. You know, that, well, there is an alternative, democratic socialism. What, what? But what he says is also a possibility, and certainly we could say has been more the case since the book was written in 1981 up to the present, is that the state would be used to make up for uh, what he's posing here as the falling rate of profit. In other words, the state would be, would be used to guarantee uh, essentially capital rent, right? In other words, a kind of a profit uh, from capital. Uh, on, the, on the part of the owners of capital. Um, and that that amounts to a deliberate policy of redistribution upwards on the part of the state. Um, so Lukachman's point is that, look, um, monetarism, uh, neoliberal monetarism basically says, look, there's only one role for the state, and that's to keep order and to manage interest rates. In other words, to, to manage money supply. Um, but in fact, they rely on the state for all sorts of other things. Um, and he gets into a lot of kind of issues du jour of the 1970s, like externalities and pollution, you know, the environment, which might still remain for us, but actually are not posed in quite the same way. In other words, you seldom hear discussion of um, ecology and environmental disaster posed in terms of externalities. You know, so the, the big BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico, like nobody addressed that as like an externality cost, right? Like that, that wasn't, it wasn't like, well, look, our policy is geared such that we accept externality costs that are prohibitive. It wasn't posed that way at all. It was basically, you know, posed in terms of how much was the state going to sue BP for, right? Which is a different, you know, there, there has been a shift since the 70s in terms of how these kinds of issues are, are posed. Um, and, of course, he means something a little bit more uh, far-reaching than just environmental costs with respect to externalities. He also means um, matters of uh, subsistence. In other words, he does, he does address the question of um, what are the social conditions for wage labor that the state is responsible for um, and you know, what is externalized uh, in, in, the, uh, in the wage labor relationship. Uh, by the capitalists. In other words, what does society have to pick up the tab for, essentially? 
Um, and that remains, right? That, that remains, and that's why if you think from a few years ago, you know, of course the right gets sick of its own rhetoric, but what was Obama called by um, the right wing? He was called the, the food stamp president, right? That this was the president who expanded food stamps beyond anything that it was meant to do um, in the face of the uh, prolonged uh, unemployment that took place. So not only did the Democrats extend unemployment benefits, but unprecedented numbers of people were collecting food stamps. And that could be seen as a kind of externality as well. In other words, externality doesn't have to mean nature. It can also be an intrasocial uh, phenomenon and, and very much the substance of politics, not outside the political realm at all. Um, okay, so, all right, coming back around to it then, Let's look at uh, what he has to say about the history of capitalism, because I think he poses it in very certain specific terms uh, for the purposes of his argument. Namely, that, and you'll hear this from a lot of people on the left today as well, when talking about the relationship of the market and the state, that not only is it the case that in a post-Fordist, post-Keynesian situation does capitalism rely on the state, but also that it's always relied on the state. In other words, that the state has always been an actor in the constitution of capital, and in fact, the original accumulation of, of capital, in other words, the original dispossession, he, he talks about the enclosure movement um, that set the stage for wage labor was in fact a state act. Now, that sounds plausible from the standpoint of a Marxist perspective. Certainly, that would sound like the materialist explanation. In other words, that what you have is the kind of ideal capitalism, which is the capitalism of the free market. But the materialist response to the ideal capitalism would be to say, well, no, that's not the story at all. Right? In other words, that's ideology in the sense of being false, being a kind of fairy, fairy tale about the origins of capitalism. Whereas, in fact, what it was was rich people using the state to dispossess the people and make them available for exploitation. That sounds plausible. And certainly, when I first read this book, um, when I was in college, that's when I read it, um, back in you know, probably around uh, 1989, 1990, and I thought, well, OK, this is the materialist explanation of history. Right? In other words, and certainly when you read Capital, Volume 1, in terms of the famous, uh, what David Harvey, among others, have called the two narratives of Capital, the logical and the historical, right? that you get the kind of ideal type, the logical, and then you get the reality, the historical, it would appear to be the case that that's what Marx is saying. That Marx is saying, well, you know, capitalism poses this logical framework, but even that framework has some internal contradictions, and then if you look at the real story, what you find is that, in fact, it didn't arise for logical reasons, but rather for contingent and highly political, concrete, material conditions right, in history. Um, and I think that Lukacsman is basically saying, look, the problem with the Smithian turn, with the Milton Friedman uh, claim of Adam Smith, is that this has always been a just-so story. Right? And he indicts Smith. He basically says, well, Smith's ideas are interesting, but they came along fortuitously at just the moment when it suited the interests of the rich people and the politicians in the UK to adopt Smith's ideas. All right, so they, they uh, illustrate Smith giving a a uh, speech to Parliament, and the parliamentarian, uh, parliamentarians are kind of nodding off, kind of falling asleep, and they're like, oh yeah, we like that idea, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> free market, yeah, let's do that. Um, but that they're really not paying attention to, to what he's saying at all. That they're not really down with the labor theory of value, for example. They're not really down with his agenda of making a more productive society and freer social relations. That what they hear is, Free market, oh yeah, we can take advantage of that. Um, and what we would emphasize then is that there are really very different moments involved here. Meaning, if Smith had a hearing in his own lifetime in the 18th century, 
uh, it was not the same hearing that his work gets in the 19th century. In other words, that the 19th century reception of Smith is actually quite different from the contemporaneous reception of Smith. Um, and what this skips over uh, to, to a great degree is, of course, what comes between those two moments, namely um, David Ricardo and also utilitarianism, and also, you know, uh, somewhat coincidentally, uh, Thomas Malthus. Right? In other words, uh, the, the origin of the idea of economics as the, the, the grim science, which also, they, I think that they do a little nice little um, Thomas Carlyle uh, responding to uh, Malthus on this question. In other words, just to, just to recap quickly, Malthus, his idea that, um, that there's an economic law of population such that uh, there will always be periods of, kind of mass starvation and die-off because we, we always outstrip our capacity population-wise to support ourselves. And that that's very much a phenomenon of the Industrial Revolution. In other words, Malthus thinks that this is a, a law of economics going back to the Middle Ages. He takes a kind of a grand scope view of historical dynamics with respect to population. Uh, but in fact, according to Marx, what it is is very much of its moment. It's not really about the past. It's not really about um, medieval conditions of the peasantry. It's really about the Industrial Revolution and the emergence of uh, an unemployment problem in capitalism. Um, at any rate, uh, so by eliding that difference, which seems appropriate given the fact that Lukacsman is responding to the Smith reception not in the 19th century, but rather in the 1970s. Um, it would appear to be the case that simply confronting Smith's ideas with reality would be kind of sufficient to debunk them. Okay, so finally, I want to come around to the major figure in the book, which is, of course, Keynes. And I mentioned earlier that uh, Lukacsman was a Keynesian economist who then... Um, you know, had his St. Paul moment falling off his horse in the 1970s and saw the light Marxism and realized, oh, you know, in fact, Marx has something to say to the crisis of Keynesianism uh, that took place in the 1970s. Um, so the question is, what was Keynes as a phenomenon? In other words, what is uh, the, the Keynesian idea um, in two different phases, uh, really, Signify. One is, of course, the origin of, of, of Keynes' own consciousness, namely in the 1920s and 30s. And the other is uh, Keynes becoming uh, hegemonic uh, after World War II. Uh, in other words, there's the question of whether Keynes really did solve the problem of the Great Depression or whether, rather, his ideas served as an ideology for the post-World War II um, regime of accumulation in capitalism. Love, yeah. Actually, that was an interesting thing that kind of got left out of the um, Keynesian discussion. The book? Yeah, because I didn't think about it because I was like, oh, it gets kind of posed, but then kind of dodged. Yeah. Well, and so he treats Hayek as like a contemporary of, of Friedman. Friedman, yeah. Whereas Hayek was really a Keynes. Mm -hmm. And then the other really interesting thing is that Hayek had this whole, he insisted that what Keynes was doing was actually creating and exacerbating these, the, the business cycle crisis. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, the whole reason that this is happening is because you're injecting artificial capital that, you know, like, well, okay, now I'm, I don't think he used the words artificial capital, but like the whole idea is that, like, you know, you're at, Keynes is actually making things worse. And I was, so yeah, and then that wasn't addressed at all in the book. Well, you know how it's addressed? It's kind of slipped in there. It slipped in there in the graph of the ups and downs of capitalism in the 20th century. And this is on page um, 72. 72. Um, in other words, there's an implicit argument made with this graph, which is that, look, in the 20th century, the only things that have ever allowed capitalism to recover were war, were World War I and World War II, essentially, and, and, uh, and the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Basically, that these, 
uh, are really what uh, were responsible for any recovery of capitalism in the 20th century. And so he, he soft pedals it, but it's there, right? It's implicit. And uh, the, other, the other point is that, in fact, he wouldn't dispute the Hayek critique of Keynes because the way Lukachman poses the question of the Vietnam War is that it's military Keynesianism that actually exacerbates the problem of the business cycle rather than solving it. In other words, the immediate backdrop for the 70s downturn, the crisis of the 60s, um, is something that's not, it's, it's actually clearly attributed to an exacerbating problem coming out of the Vietnam War. And so, it, again, it's posed as a more of an implicit question that he doesn't take fully on board, Lukachman, um, but it is there. If you kind of read between the lines, um, it's there. Namely, maybe it wasn't Keynesian policy, but rather World War II that solved the Great Depression, and solved in a particular way. Right? Um, meaning, did not solve the problem of capitalism, but rather masked it in certain ways. And that's where, of course, the book gets to in terms of uh, the, the staged, you know, imagined dialogue between uh, Keynes and Marx. Between Keynes, the ghost of Keynes, and the ghost of Marx at Marx's grave at Highgate in London um, is very much like, okay, well, is it the case that we're returning to some form of capitalism for which Marx is appropriate? Or is it the case that Marx was always appropriate, but it was kind of hidden? Right? In other words, um, it's not that, in, in fact, Lukachman is, is very critical with respect to Keynes, ultimately. In other words, he's not saying, okay, you know, Keynes kind of worked, but then failed. He's saying, no, this always had an ideological kind of thrust to it. And he also indicates that when he's summing up at the very end of the book, where he, he poses Keynes and Friedman. He's like, Keynes, you know, is aristocratic, he's the Mandarin intellectual, he's like the Mandarin of Mandarin intellectuals, or I think Brian put it, he's the economist, economist, right? Whereas Milton Friedman is this working class, like, you know, background guy, immigrant guy, who, you know, is kind of hard scrabble and, and, and pulls himself up by his proverbial bootstraps in order to attain this influence. Right, where, and so, which also implies something, it's a kind of an irony that, that Lukachman is posing, um, but that we would have to consider. In other words, was Keynes always a ruling class ideology? In a way that it's easy to sort of say, okay, well, Milton Friedman is a ruling class ideology, but what about the fact that it's not originating out of the ruling class, and also that it has support outside the ruling class? Right, in other words, there's also the question of politics being posed there in terms of a kind of Keynesian technocracy. Right? And he's, he basically poses Keynes as, look, Keynes is trying to save capitalism for itself, from itself, and to save capitalism also means doing things like raising wages and providing housing, but that's not what Keynes is interested in at all. Like, in other words, Keynes doesn't actually care about the working class, but it just so happens that helping out the working class is good for capitalism, and that's why Keynes supports it. Whereas Milton Friedman's perspective is, all the social tinkering that you do is actually bad for capitalism and bad for the working class, and yes, it might involve pain for the working class to do capitalism the way Friedman wants to do it, but ultimately, it will be in the interest of the working class. And that's where Hayek comes in as this kind of shadowy figure, like if you see the way he's depicted in the book, He's got the, the fedora hat, like, kind of over his face, and he's got the cigarette, right? He's got the Tommy gun also. So they do place him in, in the 30s, because he's like a gangster. He's like a 20s, 30s gangster. And, you know, I don't know where this is coming from, but somehow Hayek is seen as, like, you know, the really brutal, you know, hard-nosed one, whereas Friedman is kind of more kind of starry-eyed, kind of in love with capitalism kind of guy. Whereas Hayek is like, no, you know, this may not, this may not, you may not like this, but it's necessary, kind of guy. Um, whereas Friedman is like, oh, no, we've got to do this. You know. um, which, if you see the clips that I, that I posted to the Facebook, it, they're, they're, no, you've got to see Friedman, right? Because you know what he did was, 
Because he even says it. He says, oh yeah, one of the ways to get rich in capitalism is to get a, a politician friend to help you set up a TV station. But not what he was doing, because he didn't set up a TV station. He did like public access. But to literally get a TV station, you know, like WGN or something in Chicago. Um, because he says, look, really what, what we're talking about is, you know, not, not whether the state helps poor people or not, but whether capitalists use the state to get rich, right? Um, so he takes that on board. Um, but anyway, he, you know, to get his ideas out, he and his wife, like, started a talk show, meaning they started a show and they didn't have any guests. So it was just him and his wife, and they were just talk <laughs> about, like, yeah, Milt. I just think capitalism is cool. Yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> right, and then eventually they started getting, you know, more attention, but that's how they started off, because they were totally in the wilderness. Like, Milton Friedman, like, nobody was listening to him. I came across a, a wonderful reference to him in, like, Time magazine or something from the 60s, in which they described him as, like, an imp or something, because he's, like, this short guy. So they described him, like, they kind of demeaned him based on his physiognomy. Like, they were like, yeah, he's some evil imp, right? Uh, meaning no one would ever listen to this guy. And that was before the crisis. Like, that was, you know, so he was definitely in the wilderness before the crisis. And then after the crisis, he gets more and more of a hearing. But it starts off as this public access TV show, probably kind of UHF show before cable. Um, in which it's like, uh, yeah, I think that it kept the same name, Free to Choose. I think that was always the name of the TV show. Um, but anyway, you know, crazy. But anyway, so the question is the character of ideology, with, which Lukachman doesn't address per se, but it's part of his story. Um, meaning, you know, is the capitalism that one got in the 19th century really what Adam Smith wanted? Is the capitalism of the post-World War II period really what Keynes wanted? And, you know, how do, we, how do we relate the neoliberal turn in its, you know, actuality in the 70s and 80s with the ideas of Friedman? And that's where I think Hayek is this kind of, like, yeah, you know, you got to open fire with your Tommy gun if you want capitalism. I was going to say, the other interesting piece is with the democracy thing, mm -hmm. um, I I was wondering how like Schumpeter fit into the, all of this too, kind of because he had like the most capitalistic view of democracy, I think. Yeah, um, well, Schumpeter kind of falls out of the narrative between the Lukachman and the Harrington. What you get is John Kenneth Galbraith, which is a little bit weaker um, in terms of this kind of mid twentieth century kind of perspective, although nowadays James Galbraith, John Kenneth Galbraith's son, like, makes, makes appearances. He's kind of like a Paul, Paul Krugman kind of figure, um, meaning he's sort of around the edges of the mainstream in terms of policy, he's sort of complaining about neoliberalism. Um, and so what you get then is, yeah, you don't have the Schumpeter arguments, which is the John Kenneth Galbraith argument, the industrial system, Right, which um, Schumpeter is more kind of wistful and melancholic about the disappearance of entrepreneurial capitalism, essentially, and poses it more in terms of a political question. Um, whereas John Cal Galbraith is more um, a kind of technocrat, kind of more economistic kind of guy, where he's like, look, what is this system? Okay, it's an industrial system, and so how do we manage it? Whereas Schumpeter is much more classically uh, kind of liberal, kind of, you know, thinking about the, the larger social and political implications of mid 20th century capitalism. So I did, I noticed that. I noticed that Schumpeter kind of drops out of the narrative, and I kind of missed him also, because I felt like that would have been. But I think that Lukachman, to streamline his argument, it really is centered around economics. What else has to do with the origins of? Schumpeter's scenario makes no sense in trying to explain the 80s. That's right. the exact opposite of That's right. So Schumpeter, like Daniel Bell, has this kind of industrial society, post-industrial society kind of melancholy about the end of entrepreneurial or liberal capitalism. And so, in fact, these perspectives are falsified by, by history. In other words, it's not the direction that, that things actually go in. 
Um, and, you know, whereas, yeah, I mean, another part that's missing from the, from the argument that Lakashman just mentions without fully explaining is why the crisis of the 70s wasn't supposed to happen. Right, he says, look, this crisis we're in wasn't supposed to happen, according to the policy people. In other words, they were meant to be, um, you know, keeping aggregate demand up and managing mon monetary supplies such that this couldn't happen. It's kind of like you get something similar with the recent crisis with, um, am I forgetting the, uh, the chairman of the Fed, Alan Greenspan? In other words, that Alan Greenspan su successfully managed the economy for 16 years or however long he was in, in the position of the, the chair of the Fed um, through the George Herbert Walker Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and the early years of the George W. Bush administration, so over a very long period of time. And that, uh, you know, it seemed to be working until 2007, 2008. Although you could already say that the turn around 2000, there was already um, a recession in 2000 that predated 9-11, but then it got folded into, so there was this idea that the economy suffered because of 9-11. You could already see that unraveling before 2007, 2008, but basically the idea was whether Republicans or Democrats are in office, and regardless of the kind of social policies that they might be pursuing, that essentially monetarist economic policy worked. And then this wasn't supposed to happen, like the 2007-2008 crash wasn't supposed to happen, and then it's attributed to other things. Um, interestingly enough, Greenspan was willing to admit that he couldn't see it coming. In other words, he didn't immediately blame it on... Um, like the bubble phenomenon or like corruption or something like that. He, he, he was chastened by it. In other words, he was like, yeah, you know, it turns out we don't understand capitalism as well as we thought we did. Like that's, you know, essentially what he was willing to concede. Um, something similar is, is being posed by Lukacman with respect to the crisis of the 70s. Namely, this shouldn't have happened and yet it is happening. So built into the argument of this shouldn't be happening is other you know, are other dimensions that, that he's not addressing. He's kind of keeping it and without really explaining fully. Um, that's where David Harvey, just to make a little bit of a plug, that's where um, uh, The Condition of Postmodernity, um, the book by David Harvey that describes uh, the different regimes of accumulation from, you know, classical kind of entrepreneurial liberal 19th century to um, Fordist, to post-Fordist, because that's the way he addresses it. He doesn't address it so much in terms of Keynesianism. He addresses it in terms of form Fordism and the kind of settlement between capitalists and labor and the kind of social and political and cultural kind of environment for that. Um, that's where that argument would be useful as a corollary to this argument. This argument by Lukacman is really focused on um, a narrower set of concerns. And it's really animated by um, the Friedmanite neoliberal term, meaning it's 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 very much about the economics of it, and whether whether the arguments you know hold water and, and etc. Um, all right, so Keynesianism. Let's just tick that off quickly, and then we'll turn I'll turn briefly to the uh, Michael Harrington piece, um, which is. Uh, a whole other kind of uh, view of things. Um, this actually relates what motivated me to suggest this as a reading and to, to you know, have this teaching around this reading was the Thomas Piketty um, book, Capital in the 21st Century. Namely, his uh, locating of the problem of capitalism structurally in our time as being uh, the relationship between rate of return on capital and growth of wealth, right? And so basically what he attributes the inequality, like the, it's not really the inequality among different strata of the working class or lower end of society. It's really about the behavior and character 
of you know what would colloquially be understood as the one percent, namely the investor class. Right. In other words, um, you know, and that's something that Keynes has uh, at the center of his argument with respect to the way Lukacsman approaches it, namely that consumers' behavior is steady, and the only variable is, invest is investor behavior. And therefore, policy needs to be geared to ensure that investor behavior actually has the effect it's supposed to have in capitalism, uh, namely uh, keeping the economy going and uh, doing things like producing jobs and, and whatnot. Producing jobs is very much secondary, though. The question is, how do you keep capital circulating? In other words, that wealth has to become capital. It has to become uh, invested. Uh, and this is just kind of a variant idea. In other words, that there's always been profit-seeking, but what characterizes capitalism is reinvestment of profit. In other words, without reinvestment of profit, capitalism can't work. Um, and so that's really the center, and it's also what links up monetarism and Keynesianism. In other words, where they can't really be opposed is this issue of, okay, well, what policy is concerned with is the behavior of investors. Um, and then that comes around to the question of what's secondary, namely the condition of the working class, in terms of the invest investment multiplier. Right? In other words, the idea of the investment multiplier. The ideal conditions for the investment multiplier is high wages. Um, and the disciplining of profits for investment would be a kind of low profit, high wage situation, which is actually an Adam Smith argument also. In other words, that's not new to Keynesianism, um, in fact. Uh, and so even though Keynesianism is not seen as, you know, classical or neoclassical, economics, it actually does have a great deal in common with that. Um, so again, a lot of the ways in which these are conventionally opposed actually turn out not to really be the case um, with respect to uh, what Keynes's actual argument was. Um, so with respect to Piketty then, Piketty thinks that policy that has encouraged um, gross inequality in society has actually proved to be a disincentive for the use of wealth as investment capital, essentially. That, that's kind of what you see, the phenomenon of the present. It's something that Hillel Tickton, um, the Marxist economist, British-based, but uh, South African um, economist, it's what his concern has been throughout this whole period of the economic crisis, namely, why is capital not being invested? Why is money being hoarded? but capital not being invested. And whether this means some kind of permanent, kind of terminal impasse for capitalism or not. Because of course that's the way Lukacsman is also looking at it in the 1970s. He's saying, look, the degree to which the capitalists actually have the ear of the state, right? they're not going to behave in such a way that's actually good for capitalism. What they're going to do is just preserve their own wealth. Uh, and so that's why, you know, he says, look, the choice is authoritarianism, you know, so whether fascist or otherwise is just a linguistic nicety, or democratic socialism, in other words, non-capitalism. It's because he's looking at it that way, and that's how he understands the, uh, Lukacsman understands the question of the falling rate of profit. In other words, as the rate of profit declines, the capitalist class has to um, and, and behave less and less as a capitalist class and more and more just as a rich rentier class. All right, so just to round out the, the, the kind of my presentation part of it, and then we can get into some discussion, um, the Michael Harrington, the Michael Harrington, which is uh, precisely contemporaneous with this book, um, as it so happens. Uh, but I think is interesting with respect to, again, his prognosis. And just to give some background, so I gave some background for Lukacsman. He was an academic economist who was a Keynesian who, who had a crisis of faith and then converted to Marxism. Um, Michael Harrington is a later generation. He's a new left generation. A um, little bit older uh, of the cohort of the new left generation, but nonetheless very much a new left uh, generation figure. And uh, we talk about 
in the 1970s, the way the 60s left kind of cashed out in the 1970s, we've addressed it in Platypus in terms of the new communist movement, in other words, Maoism, that you get the kind of Leninist turn or Marxist-Leninist turn, but there was actually another post-New Left phenomenon, that was the New American Movement. Um, and the New American Movement is something that Michael Harrington is participating in. And that's what ultimately um, issues into the Democratic Socialists of America, of which um, Michael Harrington was the leading intellectual figure. Um, and the, kind of a mentor figure, um, either literally or in spirit, of people that we, you know, address in Platypus today, like Joseph Schwartz, uh, who we've had on a few panels as a DSA spokesperson, and Bhaskar Sankara, who was the editor of the youth publication of the DSA, uh, theactivist.org, and now is editor and uh, kind of entrepreneurial spirit of the, uh, the Jacobin magazine. Um, okay, so Michael Harrington, he has an interesting kind of background. Um, he, going back to the 60s, uh, is um, associated with um, Schachtman, like a Max Schachtmanite, uh, social democratic, kind of Cold War, social democratic uh, tendency, coming out of the 50s into the 60s. Um, and it's a fairly complicated story, but anyway, through a number of m mergers and splits, uh, two of the products, of this history are the International Socialist Organization that we have today in the United States, and they're the followers of Hal Draper, who also came out of this milieu, and the Democratic Socialists of America, which is Michael Harrington's baby. And just as a kind of a side note, so Bhaskar, who we, who we uh, have dealt with over the years before he started Jacobin, his great uh, ambition W uh, roughly contemporaneous with Platypus starting when he was a very young man, a young undergraduate uh, in Washington, D.C., was to find some way to have a merger of the DSA and the ISO. In other words, the original conception of left unity was to unify the DSA and the ISO. And what that would mean is essentially undoing all of the history of the new left and returning us to some kind of democratic, socialist, Marxist form of politics, as if all of the history of the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, and you know, le leaving alone the 90s and the zeros, had, hadn't happened. In other words, if you kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again in terms of the left social de democracy in the United States, if you could have Hal Draper plus Michael Harrington, then we could have like a viable left in the United States. And so therefore, you know, we're familiar with Hal Draper as a uh, you know, socialism from below guy and as a Trotskyist. We're not so familiar with Michael Harrington and that's why I thought that it was important for us to deal with Michael Harrington as a figure. Um, okay, so just straightforwardly the argument um, in uh, Marxism and democracy, um, of course, there are two subjects to this essay. One is the history of Marxism relative to the question of democracy, but there's also the relationship of capitalism and democracy. Uh, and we have to kind of keep both of those dimensions of the argument in, in play in our consideration of, of, of his perspective. Um, very much like Hal Draper, he's saying, look, um, Marxists have always been Democrats. And the Marxist conception of the socialist revolution has always been the democratic revolution. Um, and so it's very much in keeping with what we encounter with the Communist Party of Great Britain, their argument about um, that socialism is radical democracy or extreme democracy, and that winning the battle for socialism is winning the battle for democracy, and that essentially the working class is necessary to, to win the battle, the battle for democracy because it's the anti-capitalist class. In other words, that to win the battle for democracy would mean overcoming capitalism, which, which is equivalent to socialism. Now, why I brought that figure in, um, the CPGB and Mike McNair, is that, again, Bhaskar, when he was um, posing his ambition of reunifying uh, this left social democratic tendency uh, on the American left, historically, um, 
the DSA and the ISO today, um, which he finally figured out wasn't going to happen on both sides. In other words, that both the DSA and the ISO were recalcitrant to this. Who he turned to in terms of his vision of how this might be possible is Mike McNair's argument uh, from the CPGB on revolutionary strategy today, which is an argument about the history of left unity projects and how the left can experience phenomenal growth and organizational development through the unification of what start out as very small groups. Going back to the history of the SPD in Germany, the unity of the Lasallians and the Eisenachers, and traced through to the early Third International um, and other more recent phenomena, um, like uh, uh, the, the left split from the Italian Communist Party also represented this. And then there was some gesture in the direction of that Syriza in, in Greece is also a phenomenon um, like this. But anyway, so uh, this idea that, okay, socialists are first and foremost Democrats, coming from an ostensibly Leninist standpoint, namely Mike McNair's of the, of the Communist Party of Great Britain, uh, would seem to um, uh, jive well with uh, the Michael Harrington argument here in, in Marxism and Democracy. A um, couple of things I want to say about that in terms of the way he, he deals with the history. He has a fairly light touch with regard to Lenin, Meaning Michael Harrington is not really a fan of Lenin, but in this argument, he basically lets Lenin off the hook. He distinguishes between Lenin and Stalin, Lenin and Stalinism, and which I think is, is useful. Um, and I think it's not only that he's kind of giving Lenin a pass because he was in a good mood or something. I think that actually for the purposes of his argument in this essay, he has to give Lenin a pass because Lenin has to be seen as a radical democrat. In other words, the reason is that, okay, looking at the history of Marxism, you can't actually say that Lenin was anti-democratic from Michael Harrington's perspective. And so it's, it's honesty on his part. He doesn't like Lenin, he doesn't like Leninism, but he's honest about it. So then the question is capitalism and democracy. And of course, that question is much less about the history of Marxism going all the way back to social democracy to the late 19th and early 20th century, and very much about the 1970s and 1980s, and very much about the crisis of the 1970s. And this is where Harrington is interesting in terms of trying to give a global view of the problem, and he tries to straddle both sides of the Cold War. In other words, even though Harrington himself comes out of a Cold War social democratic, very anti-communist political tradition, in fact, what we find in this essay is that he thinks that there's a global problem coming out of the 60s, coming out of this moment, um, in which there is an impulse towards democracy that's coming up against the limits of both statified capitalism in terms of the Keynesian Fordist welfare state and its, its crisis, and also what he sees as you know, state socialism or bureaucratic collectivist pseudo-socialism, right, because he, he has the theory of bureaucratic collectivism with regard to the Soviet Union, meaning not capitalist, um, but also not socialist. And interestingly enough, he thinks that the East could lead the way in terms of a global wave of democracy. In other words, he thinks that the transition from industrial society to socialism via democracy is actually a shorter route in the East than in the West. And so, in, in an interesting way, he kind of concedes to a kind of Stalinism in the sense that he, he kind of characterizes the East as more progressive, as more advanced, because it has, has to go through less of a change to achieve socialism than the West would have to go through. And this is, you know, we might now just smile at that, uh, especially given what happened after 1989, but we have to try to grasp the plausibility of that from, from a Harrington standpoint, or why would he have thought that? Um, is there anything to that? Right? And again, I think that it really points to the question of capitalism. In other words, if we leave aside the question of his characterization of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, if we basically say, okay, he's just too optimistic about that, he's motivated by what he sees as an impasse in the West. In other words, the, the nature of the problem of achieving democratic socialism or just socialism in the West He's daunted by it. And it's very much about this moment 
uh, the crisis of the, the Keynesian Ford estate and the, the rise of neoliberalism. Um, in other words, the apparent tendency, rather, to evacuate democracy, or to, to use the Lukashman's language, to achieve an authoritarian solution to the crisis, rather than a, a democratic socialist um, uh, resolution. Uh, both Lukashman and Harrington are advocating a democratic socialist outcome, but they are conceding that, the, in some ways, the more likely outcome is the authoritarian solution. Um, which again raises the question of what do we mean by capitalism? In other words, is capitalism a free market system, modification of labor, or is it a state form, right? Is it an authoritarian state form going back all the way to its beginnings? In other words, not just lately, but from the very beginning with the Enclosure Acts and everything else, right? In other words, what, what's at issue here is, well, okay, how do we think of capitalism? Um, and again, uh, going back to Platypus's origins 2006-2007, and what we encountered very quickly was the economic crisis and figures like Naomi Klein. This is her perspective. Her perspective is, look, all this free market talk, this is just ideology. It's always been a racket. It's always been a state form for uh, fleecing the working class and robbing uh, you know, social resources on the part of the rich people. And so, you know, whatever quibbles we might have with the Naomi Klein argument, it has a venerable tradition that it's plugging into in terms of uh, people and figures that are relatively perspicacious with regard to the crisis in the 70s, like Robert Lukachman, and in his own way, Michael Harrington. And so that's why I thought, you know, this would kind of serve for us to kind of revisit the 70s by way of the, the present economic crisis and just to pose the question of, Okay, well, what do we mean by capitalism? Because these, these questions are raised when you pick up a Thomas Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century. Okay, is this some kind of update of Marx? No, right? Because, again, the way capitalism is being, is being posed uh, is, is very specific, and we have to kind of pay attention to, you know, how the problem is being posed and... and you know, why this is not really compatible with the Marxist perspective. Lukachman is very honest about that. In other words, he says, look, Keynesianism poses the question of capitalism in very narrow terms and blinds itself to what's really going on. And so it turns out that it's not that Marx has a late currency, that he was falsified for a while and then comes back, but rather that it was always valid, it was just masked. But I still feel like it's also important to try and figure out like, what is democracy or what it because, what is socialism, right? What is socialism, and then because even even like democracy and its relationship to capitalism has taken really different forms. Like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Like actually, that's kind. Of, I was almost thinking of Schumpeter more in that context. Like he had a very market driven idea or ideal of what capitalism or I mean of democracy, democracy mm -hmm. be. and then also the other interesting piece of like the 70s stuff is I think the 60s or 70s was when Carol Payton wrote yeah. her yes. book about um, democratizing the workplace and what that would look like so yeah so it's also like these, uh, just even the idea of democracy and its relationship to capitalism has one of the things that we kind of assume in Platypus is that the last time that people really tried to grasp these issues seriously, um, at least in a way that leaves kind of a textual record, is the 70s. Um, and again, what we're interested in is what were they trying to grasp and how were they trying to grasp it? And what kind of a legacy do they lead? As it turns out, they leave, leave a kind of a, a richer legacy than is apparent, meaning that a lot of this is just forgotten and so would bear some recovery, but with some caveats. Meaning, it's already conditioned by all sorts of assumptions that are problematic from the 20th century. Um, so certainly, yeah, like Carol Payton argument, you know, they are trying to grasp some things, or even Francis Fox Pippen, which, you know, again, like, the, um, 
the the clip that I, I just thought, okay, Frances Fox Pitt, I'm like, she's just this, you know, figure in the firmament of the left today. And so it's just great to see her squaring off against Milton Friedman because Milton Friedman scores some points, right? And so there's kind of a schadenfreude involved in that for me. But nonetheless, she was better then than now, right? Um, so what I wanted to say about um, the question of socialism and democracy, though, with respect to, uh, I was reading the transcript of Democracy in the Left that we just published in the Platypus Review in issue 67 this month. And Dick Howard, you know, author of The Spectre of Democracy, um, gives a very nice précis of his argument in the book, in, in his presentation at the, at the forum. And he, he has um, a perspective going back to classical antiquity, meaning Athenian democracy. And he says, well, look, you know, all these states were democratic, but only one was free, and that was Athens. And why is that? Well, because they had more of a kind of a uh, different relationship with respect to, um, you know, what we would consider to be market relations and, 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 and such. So the uh, parallel that I raised when we did the Democracy in the Left reading group a couple of summers ago in 2012 was the Leo Strauss, <coughs> excuse me, the Leo Strauss argument. Um, and he's a student of Heidegger, who's, you know, godfather of the neo neoconservatives, not the neoliberals, but the neoconservatives, the other Chicago school, the other Chicago boys, is that he had a conception of ancient Athens with respect to philosophy and democracy. In other words, that in order to have a democracy, you need a philosophical society. Um, and whereas you could turn that around and say, in order to have philosophy, you need a democratic society. Right? But anyway, this is part of his kind of culturalist kind of history of the West, the Leo Strauss perspective, is that um, the West owes its, uh, all of its benefits to um, a philosophical turn, right? this, essentially the Socratic turn, that the philosophical turn of classical antiquity that's unique to Athens is responsible for the freedom of the West and, and uh, the freedom that we associate with democracy. The coward makes a similar kind of argument. And it's with respect to the commodity form and democracy as constituent of the, of the commodity form. In other words, um, what Howard does is pose the question of socialism as the question of democracy, and then democracy is riven by two contradictory impulses, politics and anti-politics, and that capitalism can be understood as the victory of anti-politics anti in a certain way and totalitarianism can be seen as the victory of anti-politics in a complementary way. Right, so in other words, um, whereas it, what he wants is, he has a kind of political ontology in this respect. Uh, it, what he wants is uh, true democracy in the sense of um, the victory of politics over anti-politics, and that that's what socialism would be, in other words, yeah. What do you mean by anti-politics? Well, he means a bunch of things. One would be, so totalitarianism would, would be demagoguery. In other words, it would be kind of consensus mongering um, or the attempt at kind of unanimity. And uh, there's also anti-politics in the sense of trying to screen society against the state. In other words, the kind of liberal idea that um, certain freedoms should be conducted. Uh, like the kind of Isaiah Berlin kind of idea of freedom from and freedom to, right? So. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, he thinks that the victory of anti-politics would be to describe freedom as freedom from the state, as opposed to freedom through the state. Right. But and why is it anti-politics? It's politics. It's a different politics. It's a different politics. Well, because he thinks that it brings the political process to a halt. In other words, uh, he basically defines politics as an inherent situation of instability. And that the danger then is to resolve it. And you resolve it either by trying to you know, uh, unify society through the state and stabilize it that way, or by having um, you know, this image that society will take care of itself apart from politics, like through some market. You know. we're, we're shifting the concept yeah. so from politics to stability. What does that mean? Stable for whom? And what conditions? Well, he just thinks of it as like conservatism, meaning that, and it would also be disempowering, meaning it would, it would essentially rob people of their political agency. That 
that a kind of a free market liberalism would rob people of their agency in the same way that a totalitarian state robs people of their agency. Because it just says that you're, the way that you can participate in society, there's just one way, that it's not up for grabs. And so he really has, his notion of politics is, is kind of all-encompassing. That's what I mean when I say it's a political ontology. Because it's really kind of all your agency in society is political in this view. Right? It's not just the narrowly defined notion of politics. Um, it's curious. I think that, you know, ultimately I don't agree with it, but I do think that it, it throws things in a certain light, which I think is useful. And especially with respect to what Lilith was raising um, regarding Schumpeter. What, what Howard does, he kind of struggles to distinguish his perspective from a classical liberalism. He basically says, well, this sounds like classical liberalism, but it's not. You know, he kind of hems and haws a lot about it. Um, but, yeah. I mean, not to say that it just is, because, again, it's, he's posing the questions now in a post-New Left environment. And so it, it does change the emphasis a little bit from, from that of classical liberalism. Um, but nonetheless does ultimately share more features with that. And he's, interestingly enough, he's a former uh, scholar of Rosa Luxemburg, who then decided... Well, Rosa Luxemburg, you know, is part of this kind of anti-political strain of Marxism. And so he kind of turns against... Actually, two of the American scholars of Rosa Luxemburg have lately turned against Rosa Luxemburg, and that's Dick Howard and Stephen Eric Bronner. Both have decided to throw in with liberalism against Marxism, and where they were like, okay, even Rosa Luxemburg isn't liberal enough. You know, even she's too Marxist, you know, too kind of totalitarian. It's terrible, but also the trajectory is interesting. Um, so yeah, I mean, these, these are the questions that we want to raise. In other words, capitalism and democracy, are they opposed? Or is there an intrinsic connection between the two? In other words, is... Because uh, what Friedman says to Francis Fox Piven is that any society that she would consider to be free has always had capitalism going on in it. That she would have to admit that what she means by democracy and freedom, that she would have to recognize that if you look historically, that any society that she would consider to be democratic and free was also capitalist. And she doesn't have an answer to that, ultimately. Other than Chile. Like, oh, what about Pinochet? In which case, he just says, well, I don't approve of what he's doing because it's anti-democratic. He just says straight up that he doesn't support it. You know, so he's got an easy out, right? Um, whereas, of course, it's hard for her to say, yeah, Cuba or something, you know, um, by comparison. Um, so that, you know, historical and apparently, from certain perspectives, intrinsic relationship of capitalism and democracy, while at the same time, historically, it would appear to be the case that capitalism and democracy are opposed. Like the fact that both would, that this is an antinomy, in other words, that capitalism and democracy seem to be codependent, and they appear to be opposed. It's plausible looked at either way. Um, and so the best that someone like Lukachman can come up with is capitalism has always been anti-democratic. Right? It's always been dependent on the disempowerment of the people and the hijacking of the state for the narrow interests of the capitalists. So one thing that I've thought about recently is like how, I guess in some ways, how our democracy does mirror ancient Athenian democracy, mm -hmm. including the fact that in order to, to constantly govern and be part of a democratic society, you need all these other people actually doing work. Right, so in, in Athens, it was slaves, and then now, well, it's not slaves, but it, there's still that class stratification that I don't know if that is like a necessary component of. Well, why not say that it's slaves, right? Because after all, in Athens, the slaves were a lot more free than we might imagine. It's not like they were beasts. They weren't beasts of burden harnessed to machines. They weren't like chattel slaves in the American South. Right. right. They, they, they lived their own lives. A lot of them were literate where their masters were illiterate. 
um, you know, like they just carried on, right? But they just didn't have any formal standing as citizens, right? Meaning they didn't pol participate in the political sphere. Which and we might say, now. yeah, we might say that today, <laughs> like people are, you know, doing their thing, and the fact that they don't really have a voice politically, yeah, is kind of obvious, but also kind of beside the point. But wasn't the ownership significant? Well, it was, but again, it wasn't like chattel slavery. Right? In other words, it was kind of patriarchal ownership. I mean, I guess there was something of a slave market, but it wasn't like what you see coming out of like the 16th and 17th century and, and certainly what was going on in the 19th century in the United States. It's, this isn't to downplay. I mean, obviously, you know, slavery wasn't good then or now, <laughs> but ancient world slavery was, was different. And, you know, modern world, you know, like, again, chattel slavery of the 19th century as a, as a phenomenon of the Industrial Revolution was much worse, right? And like the African slave trade, I think, was worse, but, you know. Yeah, just a comment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The comparison is sort of impossible. Yeah. Because we're talking about narrative passed on with a lot of romanticized views. Oh, certainly. How, what beautiful life people had. Or so not so romantic. But we don't you know. know. Because Aristotle was honest enough to say that a slave was a tool that could speak. But you know I'm what I mean? Trying to argue. I'm yeah, just yeah. Saying mm -hmm. We can't really know. Attempts to say what's better or yeah. more is it more comfortable to be a slave in Athens than to be uh, a worker today or, or, or whatever in, in, in today or a hundred years ago? Uh -huh. it's, it's, it's sort of irrelevant. Because it is. Yeah. We don't really know. It's an attempt to fictionalize stuff. We can do it to the nth degree, and we still don't understand any more than we did before we started. That's right. No, so that's, it's like, I, I find this... Yeah, it's not necessarily so fruitful. What? what does I that mean, mean? I guess the question would not be slavery, it would rather be oligarchy. Meaning, if ancient Athens was an oligarchy, what did that mean with respect to, um, you know, its social and political values, each just among the citizens, let's say. And Whereas today, if we were to characterize it as oligarchical, right, what would that mean? And also, who would be the subjects of that oligarchy? Now, one of the things that seems to date the book, the Lakachman book, but also maybe should not date the book as much as it would appear. So the externalities is one way. Another way is the multinational corporation, right, that the multinational corporation is sort of demonized here. Um, and you know, whereas, in a sense, it's been totally naturalized now, right? Meaning, okay, who are the actors? And is it the case that they've escaped state control or rather that they've subordinated the state, right? And what would it mean to have a political contest between the people and the multinational corporations? And so, I guess in our more recent um, environment, we get things like uh, the Citizens United uh, Supreme Court decision, Namely, that you know, corporations are given free speech as persons, and you know, this supposedly like destroys American democracy forever now, right? And that basically what Obama represents is just the Democrats, however contingently perhaps, capitalizing on the system. Uh, you know, forgive the pun, meaning that they kind of out republican the Republicans in terms of their ability to raise money and and, and uh, you know win elections. Uh, in other words, that they didn't fight against the, the Citizens United decision, but rather operated more effectively within its framework. Um, but again, the kind of response that you get from Naomi Klein and others is that this is just rank ideology. Uh, how could citizen, you know, how could corporations be people? Could, how could corporations be persons? Right? And what kind of citizenship do, do, do corporations have? Right? And you know, this kind of thing. Because Naomi Klein's argument in the shock doctrine is if you see like the YouTube video version of the shock doctrine, it's very much about neoliberalism against national sovereignty. Like it's very much about how neoliberalism is about bulldozing across national frontiers and destroying national sovereignty. And that is a particular way of posing the discontent of this, of this phenomenon. Um, not one that I'd be particularly sympathetic to, but nonetheless has a, a great deal of currency. Uh, and so it does raise this question of oligarchy in some way. It raises the question of what's the polity and how do people participate in it. It does raise that question, which is somewhat different from 
you know, in other words, not the question of slavery and whether it was good to be a slave or not, but rather the question of political participation, which is, of course, why Occupy Wall Street had the character that it had, namely the, the impulse towards participatory democracy, and why you get people on the radical left saying, look, democracy is impossible unless it's face-to-face -face democracy, which we've had that expressed in a few panels that, that we've put on recently. Um, in other words, the ancient Athenian model is still upheld because the idea is that um, any kind of representative democracy is liable to hijacking. To, and that's the, yeah. the argument kind of too, yeah. It's a classic new left argument, but it still has a lot of uh, currency. But, uh, yeah, but then, but then even with that, considering that even in ancient Athens there was the, the class issue, Yeah, bringing it back to Athens is not so helpful. Bringing it back to the Roman Republic is more helpful because they had representation. In other words, they didn't just have um, you know direct democracy; they had representation, um, and they had some what we would consider to be a mixture of participation and representation. Um, so anyway, but that's just a side point. That's like a total total side point in terms of me as someone who thinks about politics. Um, so anyway, um, right, so maybe we could open it up to kind of a more ranging discussion. Let's see, I, we seem to have gotten some, uh, some... Okay, a question about Friedman. Can we consider Friedman as a critic of neoliberalism? How did Friedman understand the dichotomy between politics and the economy after the 1970s? And parentheses, economic crisis after the 70s should not have happened, but it did. Okay, so, um, right, so uh, the article that I included, um, that I wrote uh, under the, the moniker Platypus, Platypus Historians Group on uh, Friedman and Hayek and the question of freedom, in part a response to Naomi Klein, uh, does pose this question of um, judging neoliberalism against itself. In other words, um, not only judging Friedman uh, next to Hayek, in other words, using Hayek to critique Friedman, um, but also using Friedman to critique what happened. Um, in other words, and, and I use the parallel with the New Left, with uh, uh, Bill Ayers and the small schools program in Chicago, and how that um, facilitated a neoliberal turn in terms of uh, charter schools. And of course, Bel Air is like, well, we didn't intend that. That wasn't meant to happen. And yet, in fact, it shows this affinity, spontaneous affinity, between uh, Milton Friedman's discontent with the Keynesian Ford estate and uh, the new lefts, right? Um, so, how does that play out subsequently? In other words, can then Friedman be used for some kind of critique of uh, neoliberalism in practice? Maybe, and that's why I raised um, Adolf Reed. In other words, when Adolf Reed says, look, what's the dominant ideology today? And a dominant ideology not just in terms of a rosy utopianism the way Naomi Klein condemns, um, but rather in terms of actual policy, what, what's characterizing things. Because of course, whether policy works or not is another question, right? So, policy is pursued whether it works or not, and that policy is twofold. It's free markets and upward distribution of income, both of which are seen to benefit society as a whole, because what you're doing is putting more money in the pockets of the investor class, a la Keynes. In other words, when Keynes says, look, consumers are static, investors are dynamic, and so what you need to do is make investors, you need to incentivize investment on the part of investors. Um, that it, that's what upward distribution of income is meant to achieve, meaning as long as people aren't starving, it doesn't matter how rich the rich people are. Right, that's the idea. The idea is, well, and this is why people uh, react so strongly against arguments for equality and egalitarianism, is that they say, well, look, the issue is not how fabulously wealthy the rich are. The only issue is how people are doing at the bottom, and the question is how to facilitate that. But that's all freedom. That's all Friedman, that's right. And so the idea is, you know, you can actually benefit the people at the bottom 
by apparently benefiting the people at the top. Right. Yeah, right, exactly. As long as it's geared towards investment and not just hoarding or whatever. Um, so the issue then would be, um, you know, precisely this, why has that not happened? Um, now in the 80s, like in other words, if we, if we differentiate the crisis after the 70s, there is a crisis of the 80s, but that's just seen as an extension of the crisis of the 70s, namely that we're still paying off the bad effects of uh, Keynesian Fordist policy of the 50s and 60s. So they kind of alibied themselves. Today, you know, what would the response be? Well, again, the response would be, are we sufficiently kind of neoliberal? In other words, um, the Friedman perspective would be that we're not, still not sufficiently neoliberal in some way. And again, that's the question begging of the whole, the whole business, namely that um, the falling rate of profit is uh, an issue uh, that is inescapable in some way. That, in other words, the Marx perspective on the falling rate of profit remains a kind of a background issue, whether it's addressed or not. In other words, that the real limit, to put it another way, a kind of classical orthodox way of putting it, the real limit to capital is capital itself. Right? In other words, it's not bad policy. Right, um, which is the way Friedman kind of poses it. He poses it as bad policy. That really the self-limitation on capital, what's holding capital back is capital itself. And, and in other words, that's a self-contradiction. It's not contradicted from without by bad policy, by you know, mistaken egalitarianism, but rather has its own dynamic uh, self-limitation. So let me just uh, follow up on this. So now we have Danny Jacobs. Um, Quote by Keynes, quote, If indeed labor were always in a position to take action, and were to do so, whenever there was less than full employment, to reduce its money demands by concerted action to whatever point was required to make money so abundant relatively to the wage unit that the rate of interest would fall to a level compatible with full employment, we should in effect have monetary management by the trade unions, and at full employment instead of by the banking system. Keynes, of course, close quote I take it, Keynes, of course, uh, not purposely, seems to be describing the crisis of capitalism, i.e. labor's mutual alienation and exploitation of each other. To each worker, uh, they can't even act like neoclassical labor if they wanted to, and their continuing resistance furthers the economic dilemma. In what way is Keynes like a utopian socialist? In what ways is Keynes a reflection of failures of the old left? Are Friedman and Hayek utopian socialists in the sense of at least technocratic, if not rationalist, means of dealing with the crisis of capitalism? No, that's fine. Um, I think that there was a, a clip that I, I showed also about um, Hayek and Friedman. Uh, where, uh, no, it wasn't Hayek, it was uh, von Mises, right, who shows up at the meeting, you know, they're having the kind of, you know, cocktails, talking about, like, you know, neoliberalism, how can we restore liberalism against the socialist onslaught, and von Mises comes in and says, oh, you're conceding everything, right, in other words, you're all socialists, you're all a bunch of socialists. I guess I didn't link, did I link that, that clip? No, I didn't link that clip, that's a great clip, too where Friedman is kind of reminiscing on his earliest experiences um, in this milieu. And basically, von Mises condemned Hayek and Friedman for being socialists. Like, why are you even concerned with this stuff? You know? In other words, oh, you're trying to make capitalism work for everyone. What the hell is this socialism? Right? Um, and so, it, in fact, that's right, the Montperlin Society, that's right. Um, it's Switzerland, no? <laughs> this is Danny, he's, he's helping me out here. <laughs> um, okay, so, all right, the question of the monetary management by the trade unions. Okay, let's, let's look at that. Now, on the one hand, um, Keynes, like Hayek, had a critique of nationalism. He did. But he also assumes it. In other words, when he says monetary policy by the trade unions, he means at the level of a national labor market. And so it does repose the question all over again. 
meaning it poses the question with respect to national competition, I think. Um, and so, uh, now in terms of, Danny, what you're taking up here in your question about the mutual alienation and exploitation of each other, that would raise the question that actually Lukachman raises, because Lukachman kind of brings it up but doesn't know what, quite what to do with it, namely the exploitation of the third world by the first world. He, he keeps his eye on the ball by saying, look, this is a dynamic of the first world, and the third world are just losers in the game. But he does also kind of admit, if not totally concede the idea, that this could be reposed as a question. In other words, that you could solve the problem in the first world and it would still pose the question of the exploitation of the third world by the first world. He doesn't think that that's ever been the case. Like, this isn't some kind of Maoism. But he thinks it could be the case. And in fact, um, in that respect, uh, a character that I had in the back of my mind, also in terms of the title of this, of this teaching, Empire and Social Democracy, is Hobson. Uh, the liberal, British liberal, who had a critique of imperialism and who advocated for a kind of little Englandism. Or in other words, he basically said the empire is too expensive and it's against the working class's interest to support the empire and so we should, you know, jettison the colonies and just adopt a little Englandism and we'll be much better off, which is in fact what happened. What Lenin does in the imperialism pamphlet is pose the antinomy of Hobson and Hilferding because Hilferding says no, Imperialism is necessary, and Hobson says, no, it's an overhead that we can do without. And what Lenin says is that they're both true and, and false at the same time. In other words, um, that they're, that, you know, and again, it's the question of capitalism and whether we understand capitalism, um, you know, how we understand this kind of core periphery, first world, third world relation, and also how we understand the crisis of capitalism. In other words, Hobson is taking issue with the imperial state, and saying, let's jettison the imperial state and have a kind of liberal little England. And uh, according to Spencer, because I don't really know that much about Hobson, he was, he was sympathetic to Fabian, you know, laborism. Um, whereas Hilferding is, in a sense, saying, no, there's another problem, with, namely the accumulation of capital that we can't ignore, namely what we would uh, include here under the rubric of the falling rate of profit. In other words, that the dynamics of capitalism over its history has this tendency um, that you know, creates a, a crisis with respect to profitability and, and more, more broadly, a crisis of accumulation, uh, of which exploitation of the third world is one possible outlet. In other words, that's not the only possible outlet, but it's one possible outlet. Um, uh, or the way uh, Kautsky would put it at the time, like before World War I, was the exploitation of agricultural countries by industrial countries, is the way that he put it. Um, yeah, so I would say that that's an issue with respect to Keynes, namely that if it's posed this way as monetary management by the trade unions, one is still assuming that this is occurring at a national state level, and that basically what we're talking about is a crisis of the national labor market as opposed to the international labor market. Which of course in our time we can't kind of accept that at all because of supposed globalization. As if that weren't the case before, of course it was the case before, <laughs> but now this is how people kind of you know, explicitly deal with it. I don't know if that helped Danny. Okay. <laughs> um, because, of course, what's meant by democracy? And I think that Zizek, in uh, one of the interviews you know, that we've done, we did an interview with Zizek, and he said, look, we, okay, what would socialism be? Would it be global democracy like the uh, Galactic Senate in, in George Lucas's films? Like, in other words, you know, can we really imagine that this is what it would be? And he kind of dismisses it. Right. Interestingly enough, I mean, you know, Zizek, he's kind of on every side of every issue, so I'm not going to hold him to any particular position, but he raises this. In other words, is it imaginable that we would have global democracy? And what would global democracy entail? What would it mean? Um, I think that Lukachman sidesteps that 
Um, in some ways, Harrington sidesteps it, although I think that Harrington probably has a kind of Kantian idea of a kind of global federation of democratic republics kind of idea, um, in which case it's a kind of a non-issue. We might pose it a little bit differently, and this will seem like a little bit of a, of a, of a kind of from left field uh, offering on my part. But the idea of democracy needing to be realized, but also needing to be overcome as a necessity, meaning the anarchist position, right? Which we can take issue with the details of it in its concrete imagination, the um, you know, mutual aid cooperation communities, the global federation of mutual aid communities. We can, we can kind of leave that aside and just get to the, down to the brass tacks of it, which is the idea of why anarchy, why not democracy? In other words, where the anarchists basically argue, well, we don't want the rule of the people, we want the rule of no one, meaning we want a situation in which it's not necessary for anyone to rule. And that, classically speaking, Marxists have always agreed with us. In other words, that Marx and Lenin have always, you know, for, for two, you know, just to mention those two, always said, look, the goal of socialism is the same between Marxism and anarchism, meaning overcoming the need for democracy. Um, in which case, when you're describing the global galactic senate or whatever, what you're talking about is the dictatorship of the proletariat. You're not talking about a, a future society forevermore. Nate. Um, I guess one thing that maybe came up earlier, sorry, Jim and Nate, but would be you know, these, all, these, all these different people have like different sort of conceptions that we've like touched on, but then, of course, like classically in Marxism, the idea was voting for Mm -hmm. as a way to kind of describe this sort of um, a crisis in democracy that I mean I think like Harrington at least posted in terms of like collectivism versus well, that's democracy right. That's right. Mm -hmm. so it's like well, what we have now is collectivism but it's not true democracy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whereas you know I think it's like no like you know there are, there are meaningfully democratic institutions like with, that come along with this like collectivism the question is like why are they kind of why do they seem to be practically hollowed out in a certain way, or why do they seem to have a different, why does there seem to be a form content problem, if you could put it that way, why does there seem to be a democratic form, but not a democratic way of social being? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and the way that that was talked about, you know, classically in Marxism was in terms of sort of Bonapartism, but that also, I think, was sort of clarified by, um, by the fact that there was an ongoing working class struggle for socialism. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, I, or at least manifested. Yeah. So I mean, is that sort of you know, are all these people kind of just grappling with like what Bonapartism looks like without a working class struggle for socialism? Is that like the? Well, I think that Harrington. I don't know if he's quite conceding that. I don't know if Harrington's saying let's assume that the workers are out of it. I think that he's actually assuming the opposite, which is that workers are still a dynamic democratic. Um, agency. Uh, in other words, you know, of course what he has in mind is Solidarność in Poland. Right? This is one of the reasons why he's much more rosy in his prognosis for the East than for the West, is that he's saying, look, if Solidarność were to attain what it's aiming for, it will actually have less to contend with than a similar movement that the United States would have to contend with with respect to capitalism. In other words, it's a more straight shot to socialism. Um, because you wouldn't have to deal with the kind of entrenched civil society interests. Um, now, which raises the question of liberalism, right? So, Lukachman is basically attacking the neoliberals for, in fact, even if not in intention, advocating an illiberal liberalism. In other words, that what they're really bringing about is uh, not a liberalized capitalism, but rather an illiberal capitalism. And that's because their ideas are getting a hearing in a context in which they're being put to other uses. In other words, um, where the state's purpose is being narrowed, and that essentially the state's purpose is being narrowed, again, to get back to Adolf Fried's formulation, to upward redistribution rather than free markets. That it's being done under, in the name of free markets, but it's really being done in the interest of upward distribution. Um, and that this is the this is the kind of authoritarian heart of it all, and and Lukachman is is good on that point. Um, in which case, the question is the relationship of democracy and liberalism. In other words, can you have an illiberal liberalism? That's what neoliberalism looks like, or kind of authoritarian liberalism. And what is that about? 
Now, the last time, if we look at it in terms of the imagination on the left, and, you know, I have to say myself, I'm also gripped by this. I remember seeing uh, one of Obama's early State of the Union addresses, and he said something like, the most effective anti-poverty measure is a first-rate education. And I just blurted out when I'm watching TV, what is this Gilded Age bullshit? <laughs> Right? In other words, the last time that we had an illiberal liberalism, in a sense, or an undemocratic liberalism, in the classical sense, was the Gilded Age, was pre-World War I, like late 19th century, early 20th century, kind of age of robber barons, etc. Well, guess what? What differs between that period and our period is that that was also the height of socialism as a movement, as opposed to now. I Meaning the last time we had a Gilded Age scenario, there was a mass working class movement for socialism in the advanced capitalist countries, and there, there isn't today. And it, the little bit that Lukachman gets into why there is no socialism in the United States, I want to say something about that, because it's important. Um, I think that the question is not why is there no, capital, uh, no socialism in the United States, but rather what is socialism? Meaning, if there was socialism in Europe and not in the United States, what does that say about socialism? <coughs> now, what he does say um, is that, you know, basically the height of socialism in the United States was before World War I. It was Eugene Debs' Socialist Party. And he says, look, even in the Great Depression, socialism didn't make a comeback. It didn't reattain that level. Right? So, relatively speaking, you know, there wasn't socialism in the United States relative to Europe, but there was. There was, in fact, and you know, presidents were assassinated by anarchists uh, in this period in the in the Gilded Age era. Um, you know, there was you know there was the specter, you know, to use Marx's expression, the specter of communism in a way that there isn't now, right? And so, in this respect, um, you know, that would be the difference. That linking it up, we would say that you know, Bonapartism, classic Bonapartism, Louis Bonaparte, Napoleon III Bonapartism, is a situation of uh, illiberal liberalism, meaning society is liberal in the sense of um, there's a freedom to rip off the public by the cronies of the state, but it's not particularly liberal because it's an authoritarian state. And it certainly isn't democratic. So I would say that that's, you know, again, to kind of round out the discussion, that that's really what's at issue here. Um, and also, when was the United States really democratized? Well, right? well it, was, it, was, it was via the kind of going apart as Lincoln, yeah. actually. Right. Um, but I'm just mean, curious, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it does take a very peculiar, um, it does take a very peculiar form of development. Because like America's kind of clearest voter part this moment is actually Lincoln, and it's, it has a kind of progressive content to it. Absolutely. That is, I think, much more obscure in the case of voter um, part. Which it almost took on a real content too in the period of Reconstruction. In other words, it's also it's not okay. You can look at the imperial presidency emerging with Lincoln, but also the most radically democratic period in American history was Reconstruction, was after Lincoln. And the question is, why did it fail? Um, well, one <laughs> cheap way of addressing that is that, of course, the 1873 panic uh, basically made it impossible for the federal government to sustain it. And so even though there was political pressure, it also became a kind of a non-viable uh, non policy at that moment, and so it was vulnerable. And, uh, of course, the KKK had a lot to do with it as well. Um, but, you know, it was kind of a perfect storm of circumstances, which might seem like a kind of facile answer, but it is an explanation well, that people have given. It was a general, it was also a generational shift, like the firebrand old radical Republicans were like... The 1848ers. Uh, yeah, were, yeah, the 1848ers were, were disappearing. Yep, absolutely. Um, okay, so um, I feel like there was one point, though, that I wanted to address. Oh, right, okay, so socialism, liberalism, and democracy. Um, back to the Friedman point, the Friedman and Hayek point. Um, namely, that, you know, socialism, the, the struggle for socialism produces its opposite. Now, that's where we come around to the Harrington point, which is collectivism, like his 
peculiar definition of like collectivism versus democracy, bureaucratic collectivism versus democracy, um, which again is, a, is an attempt to grasp the same dilemma, I think. Uh, namely, okay, why was the apparent democratization of the state in fact um, disempowering or kind of a, a mark against freedom. So I found myself reading, you know, I have Adolf Reed on my mind, so I found myself reading the, the text that we read in the reading group from 1978, that Black Particularity Reconsidered. And, uh, you know, he's very good at talking about the kind of long-term ramifications, meaning that the crisis of entrepreneurial capitalism was never actually solved, but it was rather just channeled in certain directions. It was channeled into a kind of a management state and that the management state uh, achieved certain things, but then went through a crisis and then was reconfigured. So the way he puts it is a kind of postmodern multi multicultural state is still a management state as opposed to an entrepreneurial state, but it's just managed differently. In other words, what was once managed through um, like labor unions is now managed through constituency groups in terms of multiculturalism, but it, it amounts to the same thing. And he calls it the cretinization of democracy. It's really wonderful. Um, you know, meaning that you turn what are ostensibly democratic constituencies of the state into wards of the state. Uh, it's their cretinization. In other words, what he says is that blacks went from being a democratic insurgent force to being a cretin of the state, and that women followed and gay people, and, you know, like basically like that that's been the root of management is that all these democratic upsurges have just been turned into objects of the state. Um, and that's, you know, that's where his critique of, um, of Keynesian Fordism actually is an attempt to take on board and outstrip and go beyond the Friedmanite critique, because that's Friedman's critique also, except it obviously goes beyond that. Because Friedman basically has this kind of unwarranted optimism that if you cut loose the wards of the state, they'll just take care of themselves, right? And that's capitalism as freedom, and no, right? <clears throat> it's also, I mean, I think it's also interesting that the political imagination, like in the, I think in the 80s and 90s, kind of like after this and kind of like, you know, confronting it, but in a sense, actually, really, just kind of rationalizing it. It often was this kind of like melancholy despair that that like these different groups of people were ever even like you know that the, that the state ever even tried to like take care of people in the first place. That that became the radical critique. Yeah. So the response to neo it's a canard was a kind of like mm -hmm. anti-liberalism. So I mean, this is where you get like these books about like you know was it good that the slaves were ever free and like all this stuff that's like totally oh like, total insanity yeah. The, yeah. That's the state of the art of the discussion today. Yeah. But then, in other words, dealing with it, that I mean, you know, in other words, neoliberal, like you know, neoliberalism can be seen as a crisis of, of liberalism that's being kind of resolved but not fully politicized in a certain in certain respects, and that the kind of left's response to that largely was a kind of just a kind of melancholy that, like, well, like you know, I don't know, like these, you know, like it was it was foolish for the state to ever try to be like like multicultural or anything like that in the first place. Like true multiculturalism would have been like, you know, um, black people living on the same sharecropper grounds like for the past 150 years. Like that, you know, did that like... Um, the you mean the black belt? Yeah, like just remained or something. Mm -hmm. um, or like, you know, because then, it would, then they would at least have like sovereignty or something. Exactly. In their, in their area. Yeah. They'd have their own community. Um, mm -hmm. Well, actually you get that from Henry Louis Gates. Yeah, they do get this perspective. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, they, all those ideas, there's nothing really new to have All those ideas, of course, people had at the time, but they kind of gained a, a different type of lease on life later um, when people kind of reappropriated them. Right. So again, just to bring it back around to um, the issue that Lukachman leaves off with, which is the idea that um, you know, there is this crisis of capitalism and that it's not resolved, but rather takes, in a sense, um, more and more politically intractable forms. Like increasingly <coughs> politically intractable forms. Uh, and again, you know, why someone who is a Keynesian economist would be motivated to return to Marx 
on a rather, what can appear to be a kind of obscure or purely economistic point, the falling rate of profit. And again, to get back to it, the way he defines capitalism as um, private property and capital goods, well, no, it's a social relation. And the question is that, that social relation of the workers to the means of production, um, does it have a self-contradiction, or is it simply the contradiction of two interested parties who have conflicting desires or motives or interests? Um, and, you know, in a sense, the argument would begin where he ends his argument. Right, so it kind of comes, comes all the way around to it. And then the question would be, okay, well, how is that even posed today? Like, is it manifesting as this kind of a problem today? And that's what I mean to say that sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll hear us in Platypus saying, do we still live under capitalism? It's because capitalism was defined by Marx's self-contradiction, and the question is, how is that contradiction manifesting itself? Um, yeah, both. <laughs> One of the okay, yeah. One of the strange things that I was assigned to read this last quarter was that awful book, Conscious Capitalism. I don't know it. Yeah. It's by the CEO of Whole Foods. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh god! Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was it was ridiculous. Didn't I know someone who worked at Whole Foods for a little while? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's somebody. My sister did. Oh, yes, your sister, that's right. I thought so. Okay. Man, yeah. But, yeah, but that, I mean, it was, it was, uh, like, it, it's not even, like, you can't even respect, like, it was, there's so many holes What in class it. made you read this one? Sociology of Organizations. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was, <laughs> I mean, but it was kind of like a really weird it did kind of express like this, some kind of weird tendencies, I guess, which is I think that people are starting to just like see, um, I think see like companies or corporations as the new sphere of like political involvement, mm. and political mm. engagement, and, and not in like not in like an act. Well, yeah, not in an activist sense or anything, but it's just like where people are expect to even have to play a role in, like, the determination of, like... It's where union and, organizing would have to take place at some level. What was It's that? where union organizing would have to take place at some level. Right, and then, and, like, the, the, the thing is... is in other words, you'd confront corporate culture. That's what you'd confront. Right, but, like, the, the idea is that the corporate culture, like, and worker culture should not be at all diametrically opposed. The whole idea is that, like, these workers are, are they're aiming for something more than just profit, and therefore they're more fulfilled, and therefore they Oh, yeah, more, they're partners in the company, definitely. Blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. like, uh, they're associates. Right, oh, no, team members. Well, team members, right. I was going to say, like, Whole Foods <laughs> has its own whole thing, yeah. you know, but um, more, more generally speaking, you're an associate. Right, in a lot of places, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, the whole thing just really did, and I'm like, I'm sure that there are better articulated. I mean, let me just say, <laughs> with respect to that, I think that probably there will always be that level of attempts at worker organizing. But it's right? not like it's totally still top down. Or, like, oh, certainly Whole Foods, so right? But what I'm saying is, what would it mean to try to organize the workers of Whole Foods against the company? Like, that would be awesome. But the question is, can that happen without a vision of socialism motivating it? In other words, can it be just the spontaneous experience of exploitation by a company? Right? Or, to, I don't know, bring, you know, bring a kind of tangential example. Um, Certainly the ISO exists. Because they actually, I mean, one of their events last year, they had a, a couple of ISO members who were just giving a speech about organizing the The activist union. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a question. They're doing the same thing with McDonald's. Uh -huh. The question is whether or not 
they can they successfully motivate? You mean the recent protest out in the suburbs of uh, McDonald's mm -hmm. headquarters? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're attempting to form a union. Uh huh. But will it be successful? Is there, there's certainly the workers aren't being motivated with this idea that, that there's um, mm -hmm. some, some, some plan to change society. Uh, yeah, pursue <laughs> socialism. Um, but rather, they're, um, they really seem to be focusing on this issue of the minimum wage. Raising the minimum wage, which, by the way, is all about uh, the midterm elections and also about 2016. I mean, in other words, the rhythm of this stuff is very much about the mainstream politics, even when it appears to be grassroots, grassroots spontaneous. Right. It's still, in other words, someone's thinking of something, and you know, someone has a big picture in mind, and the big picture, unfortunately, is in the United States, and therefore for the world, since the United States is such a dominant player in the world the election cycle. And so it's all about discontent with the Republican majority, uh, the continued economic malaise. I mean, there does seem to be, that seems to be the next thing on the congressional agenda is raising the minimum wage again, right? And, and, and then there's, there's the idea of a differential minimum wage, meaning that certain cities should have higher minimum wage. You know, like that's been going on for a while. Um, but these are not mutually exclusive by any means, but they're meant to work in tandem. Right. Which is why, like the Chicago Socialist campaign, the fact that it boils down to the fight for 15 means that it's about the Democrats ultimately, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so, because it's just a bargaining position essentially. And, and they, yeah. would, they get substantial. They would get substantial super PAC money from from these workers, like just working for the SEIU right now. Mm -hmm. Trying to get like um, ten dollars per month from these childcare workers, who are getting like a four hundred dollar, three hundred dollar check. So they have to work a full day and make that ten dollars, which is then going to the super PAC. So these campaigns, yeah. yeah. So it's a cash cow in that sense. It is. I mean, but you can't, you can't, you can't, uh, you know, gainsay or vilify the fact that the unions try to, you know, have a war chest. You know, they have to. Um, no, what I was going to say though, with respect to the vision of socialism, is that. You know, the vision of socialism can't be posed outside the question of capitalism, meaning I think that um, someone like Naomi Klein just thinks that socialism is anti-capitalism, and so therefore it's like people like in communities like caring about each other, that that's socialism, and capitalism is just the predators ripping that off. And, and so, you know, in that respect, you know, the vision of socialism that would have to motivate a working class politics would also have to be very clear on what capitalism is. Meaning capitalism can't just be rich people ripping people off, right? Um, and again, that's where I felt like going back down to brass tacks, going back to the 70s and, and dealing with like this kind of an argument, like a kind of ex-Keynesian, new Marxist, you know, newfound Marxist argument. Um, really is about trying to take on board that question. In other words, um, you know, like, okay, how is the society really organized as opposed to uh, like some kind of moralistic, you know, well, capitalism is what people do when they exploit you or something. And, you know, and the, the system is just understood as the rigged game of that as opposed to, okay, you know, because again, I guess the way that I put it in somewhat jargony language is the dialectic of capitalism and socialism. In other words, that in order to have a really convincing view of socialism, you have to have a convincing view of capitalism. For politically minded people, in other words, beyond their you know, motivation to fight against immediate oppression, to have them really be politically motivated, you did have to be serious minded about with the kind of greater, you know, because I feel like, I mean, my experience anyway, going back to talk, trying to talk to workers about Marxism, is that it just goes immediately to the Soviet Union question, meaning, oh, they tried that, it didn't work. And it's not a naive question, actually, right? It's like, oh, well, how do you answer that? You know, well, it was tried, but it didn't work. It's like, oh, well, it wasn't tried? Why, because it didn't meet certain moralistic criteria? You know, like, what would it mean to say that it wasn't tried? And Again, the kind of questions that we were raising just now in terms of, like, uh, okay, is, you know, do you pose the question of capitalism at the national state level, right? Um, but that goes to the heart of it. In other words, the question of, okay, what would it need to try? Now, 
in this respect, so the, the tangential point that I want to raise is like the Lukács point, which is the CPGB, you know, they hate Lukács for over-philosophizing and over a theoretical overkill. And then James Turley, you know, the, the young guy uh, in the CPGB, his, you know, magnum opus against Lukács was basically like, well, Lukács's conception of socialism is pretty primitive because it's just workers struggling at the point of production against the capitalists, but that's already socialism. That somehow he, that's where he got out of, the, of history and class consciousness, and I was like, whoa, how would this even be, like, where do you even begin? And so he thinks, therefore, that Lukács is perfectly suited for groups like the ISO, which is economistic and workerist, and is just about trying to convince people who are organizing on the, sh the, 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 you know, the, the workplace, the shop room floor, that they should be Marxists, right? And, right, and it's kind of like, okay, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a kind of vision of socialism that is not democratic, but rather workerist economistic. Right. In other words, the narrowing of the of the, the scope and the problem of capitalism. This might be slightly seem tangential, but I think it'll actually kind of get into it. Is that I mean, you know, there were classically there were all the there was there were all the debates about like the nature of the workers' demands at a certain point mm -hmm. and the kind of basis for the kind of where the struggle is. And this is, by the way, when we do anarchism this summer. Mm -hmm. This is where the Bakunin argument against Marxism is going to be located. Right, but I mean, like, and, but, and that's also, in a weird way, like, um, I think, like, Bernstein, there's, a, there's some elements of his argument are actually anarchist. They are. They are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, going back to Proudhon, which is that, like, well, the, the, like, the advancement of the workers' demands can be measured by, like, how much they're, like, kind of dealing with immediate economic questions, like, increasing the wage, because it is this kind of like idea of like increasing a lot of workers, mm -hmm. and that would be that that like just by doing that, you'll raise their sort of social kind of uh, their level of like social existence, such that they'll kind of organically be incorporated into society as like a citizenry in a way that like now they're second class citizens. Um, whereas, mm -hmm. you know, whereas I mean the. The, the sort of response to that, or the kind of the, the argument from, from like Marxists, or at least some Marxists, was that, well, actually, like, kind of the deepest question isn't an economic one, but actually a political one. Like, in other words, you know, like, you're, you know, obviously you want workers to raise their, you know, for a wide variety of reasons, to raise their sort of general lot in society. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, like, the, you know, the point is to actually politicize directly through the working class movement the production of wealth in society. Mm -hmm. That, you know, things like when, where, and how guns are being manufactured would be a fully political question that would be handled by, you know, something like on that scale even, um, would be something that, you know, would be handled in a more democratic way. And also, what constitutes wealth? I mean, to bring it around, yeah, because we skirt the issue, a la Postone, we skirt the issue of, you know, what someone like Peter Hudis of the Marxist Humanist sometimes accuses us of being economist and, and workerist in our own perspective. Uh, you know, Marx has a good definition of wealth, which is time. You know, like, what, what wealth would be, what social wealth would be, would be more free time for everyone. Um, and, in other words, you know, really locating the question of capitalism very specifically, um, namely that um, some people are overworked and some people are underworked, which is a problem of the value of time, and that wealth would be greater availability of time for everybody, essentially. Um, which is very much in keeping with like a 60s new leftism, but disappears in the 70s, because again, what happens with the 70s is that the question of unemployment comes back. So under the full employment regime, then it's like, hell yeah, we just don't want to work anymore. You know, we want to smoke pot at the factory and not get our limbs, like, ripped off as a result of it. Um, and then in the 70s, it's like, wait a second, we're losing our jobs. You know? um, let's look at Adoni's question. How does Harrington's view of social democracy, collectivism as a problem, turn into the social democracy of Klein, collectivism is to be embraced? Um, Okay, let's, let's unpack that a bit. So with Harrington, it's bureaucratic collectivism, 
meaning it's not just collectivism, it's bureaucratic collectivism. So collectivism, the distinction between collectivism and democracy is that, of course, you can't say bureaucratic democracy. Right? So what you're talking about in terms of bureaucratic collectivism is that the collectivist character of society is being perverted into a bureaucratic political... Mm -hmm. You have a definition collectivist. What are you talking about? Well, um, what's meant by it <coughs> is that actually the economy is geared towards you know, the production for need. In other words, that in the Soviet Union, it's not really about exploiting workers' labors to benefit a small group of people. It, it rather is geared towards the collective benefit of everyone, but it's handled bureaucratically as opposed to democratically. So again, the issue is bureaucracy and democracy. It's not collectivism, per se. It's rather the reason that Schachtman and others called it bureaucratic collectivism is to concede a point. It's to basically say, look, it's not about one group of people exploiting another, so much as it's about um, uh, you know, how production is being organized, and so that's why it ends up going in the direction of like a Hal Draper socialism from below kind of idea. Meaning that socialism would be collectivist, but not bureaucratic, right? So Harrington's not attacking collectivism. That's, that's what I would say with respect to that question. Um, so it's not a matter of uh, Harrington attacking collectivism and, and Klein embracing collectivism, it's rather that Harrington has an understanding that, that capitalism does put the question of the social collective on the agenda, and that Klein kind of naturalizes that, that issue and just says that traditional uh, social forms are collectivist in a way that, of course, they're not. It's really only capitalism that raises, like the, the question that you raised earlier about the tide that raises all boats. Well, ancient societies aren't concerned with raising all boats. So it's only in capitalism that you have an ideology that claims that capitalism is the tide that raises all boats, because prior to that, no one would have cared. In other words, it's just poor people, whatever. Um, so collectivism isn't so much the issue, um, but let's turn to the other, other facet of the question. Klein's anti-NAFTA social democracy of the 90s um, seems to have passed, uh, meaning, well, not entirely, because people will still talk about um, the general agreement on trade and tariffs, um, and this, uh, I don't know if it was Chris Hedges, somebody in the Klein universe wrote an article about how the Pacific Free Trade Agreement was fast-tracked without any democratic, you know, accountability. All right, so this is still there on the left. Um, you know, in other words, the NAFTA and anti-NAFTA was like the first blush of this, but this still captures the imagination of the left, I would say. Um, okay, now, the, it's shifting, shifting gears quite a bit. How are we to regard the transformation of social democracy before 1973? In other words, I take it to mean in the golden age, in the 50s and 60s. Through, then after 1973, through the 1980s and 1990s, up until the most recent concerns about anti-austerity, etc. Okay, so this is something that we crack our heads against. And again, if we had approached the question of social democracy in Platypus one way rather than another way, we would have done it differently. Meaning, I chose to approach it this way through this Lukacsman book because of the Thomas Piketty capital of the 21st century and the neo-Keynesianism. This isn't exactly the way it's posed by our other uh, kind of the concerns of our other activities, namely the difference between the United States and Europe and Canada. And so, for instance, the Quebec crisis um, of a couple of years ago, Quebec being the most social democratic of the provinces of Canada, and Europe being more social democratic than the United States. In other words, how the recent economic crisis has hit home against social democracy as a policy as, and as a form of politics uh, differently there than here, if we were to put it you know, kind of, uh, grossly. Um, that obviously the United States and, and to a lesser degree the UK is ahead of the curve with respect to neoliberalism and neoliberalism is making a kind of a late arrival in, in Europe and, and Canada. That raises the question of social democracy somewhat differently. Um, I guess that I'm naturalizing it, meaning I'm basically saying, look, 
the problem that starts in the 1970s doesn't go away, it proceeds. And maybe it's making a late arrival now in Europe and in Canada, but it's still the same problem. In other words, it gets to the issue of was there a point to trying to consider the present crisis in terms of the 70s? And I should also say um, then that this is a question that we could have and should have raised in 2008 rather than waiting until 2014. But it's also the, the question that we could have posed in 2013, um, last year, uh, namely uh, 40 years of 1973. In other words, we did a 40 years of 1968, or attempted to do a 40 years of 1968 in 2008, but we should have done a, well, this was an idea that the organizational committee had for a series of four of it, nobody really took us up on it. So the closest we came to it was radical interpretations of the present crisis, but we would have addressed it in terms of 40 years of 1973, and this would have allowed us to deal with this kind of a question of the, the fate of social democratic politics. And the emphasis would have had to have been then on our non-American chapters, in fact. Because this, the story, I mean, we would have done it here as well, but where the non-American chapters would have um, contributed to the discussion of, in terms of having an international series of fora, it would have been this question of, okay, well, how do we understand social democracy as part of this history? And that's where our deficit, namely that we don't have a section in France, would have really hurt us. Because um, the Mitterrand experience is really important with respect to this. In other words, the fact that Mitterrand is a neoliberal turn. In other words, it's the victory of socialism after Gaullism, but it also coincides with the neoliberal turn, and it does take a certain form uh, in France. And so... A socialist yeah. is implementing neoliberal policy. A socialist is, is implementing neoliberal policy. In other it words... In, it's more obscure, but this also happens in Mexico. Like Mark working that's right. It happens with the, with the PRI in Mexico also in the 80s. That's right. And so it doesn't have to take the form that it takes in the United States and the UK, the victory of Reagan and Thatcher. It can also take the form of... And a, a very much a new left socialism also with the Mitterrand. Uh, I don't know if that, that Adoni had, had uh, th th does that help? That's just to pose the problem. It's not so much to answer it. <clears throat> All right, so we've gone two and a half hours nonstop. So maybe we will, we will uh, adjourn. And, uh, you know, like I said, this is just to lay out certain issues that we would have to address in terms of our ongoing attempt to investigate um, the relevance of historical Marxism for the question of capitalism and therefore of socialism. Thank you.